Because you don't even know what website to go to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I love October. Right. <coughs> so, you go to hellosmart.com and put in the access code 751798. Okay, Not there's only like six people. I guess some people are not bothering. I tell you what, I'm not gonna bother to. I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I'm loving the attitude. Seven five one. Yes. Seven nine eight. Thank you. The code stays the same all the time. First lesson of the third year, right? Oh, it's not exciting. So you've only got 22 weeks of teaching left and then you graduate. Less than six months. It's exciting times. And then you're out of here. And I never have to see you people ever again. It's fucking sweet. Um, you all right? Margin. What's the matter with you people? What, is it, this is a third year lecture with like 12 people. <coughs> the idea of being silent at this point ain't gonna work, all right? So. Hello. Hello. I gotta go through the whole thing, don't I? The whole thing again. So. Those of you who just walked in, go to the website hellosmart.com, put in the access code 751798. We will take two seconds while everyone gets up to speed. What's this? There's probably, because of the awful nature of the last two years with regards to COVID and so on, there's probably people in this room that you have only spoken to on a nodding acquaintance basis. We're going to change that right now. I'm going to take you right back to the first day of secondary school. And you're going to say who you are, what you did over the summer, and extra humiliation, what your favourite video game is. And I say extra humiliation because I am going to kick your ass. So we start right to the back, seeing as he's all action all the time, cannot bring a pass, is not going to be recorded as present in this session at all, is undoubtedly going to get an email telling him he's going to be withdrawn from the course within three weeks because he hasn't swiped into anything. Josh Davis. Is it going to be I've introduced you, but talk to these people. Uh, yeah, well, uh, my name's Josh. Um, I spent the summer uh, working a shake job at Morrison's. Ah, uh, but doing what? Home delivery. Home delivery. Yeah, so he's running about the shop with the trolley. Yeah, with the PD, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the personal device, and yeah. <coughs> like, um, how did you troll people? How did I troll people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you can actually, you can take photos um, of the items where you can't scan them, if there's no way to scan them. So they, that's for like spirits, you should, give them, you should give them bread. It's like 20 quid wasted. Yeah. Pretty much. This um, is why you never get home delivery, right? Always go to the shop yourself. 
Yeah, yeah, don't get it from Morrison's total delivery. Who yeah, would get home sure. delivery from Morrison's? I can understand, like, you know. What was the other question? Uh, favorite video game? Hmm? What was the other question? Favorite video game? Yeah. Resident Evil 2. Why? Which one? Uh, First of all. Either original or the new good. Okay, so uh -huh. the original was released in what? 1997, technically, 1998 for most people, though. Uh, so that game is now 24 years old. So in the interim period, there's been 24 years worth of decent games that have come out. Why on earth would Resident Evil 2 be your favourite game? I'm probably nostalgia one. Nostalgia for the time you weren't born? For a time that... Well, when I was... <laughs> when I, when so I it's was nostalgic born. for me, because I was 18 when that game came out, but you weren't born. Well, my parents probably weren't very great at parenting, but they, they let me on it like, quite quickly, so... <laughs> Okay, well, I don't want to cast massive aspersions on people I've never met, but all right, that's fair enough. Um, it's a good game. Yeah, to be fair. Better than Resident Evil 1. It's probably not as good as Resident Evil 7. Okay. That's a judgment call, more than anything, yeah. Resident Evil 7 in virtual reality is pretty good, to be fair. And I wrote about it in a book, about how some psychopath swung a spade at me, and I literally... <laughs> kind of lost. No, 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 it was much worse than that. I really? sort of fell over, yeah. I literally went down. Yeah, it was the only time that's ever happened in VR. Right, so these <coughs> other people, we should go to this gentleman here. What's your name? Um, your my story? name is William. You can just call me Will. Um, I played some video games and did some sports over the summer. Haven't really done much. Uh, my favorite game is League of Legends. Why? Why? Um, honestly, I've been playing it for quite a while when I was a kid and it's just kind of a game I've always stuck with. It's like a comfort game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I have quite a bit of friends that play it too, so yeah. Okay. Any other League of Legends in here? Look at you all not admitting to shit. <laughs> There's a few people who play League of Legends. <coughs> I don't, but um, I have given it a go, but I don't play it now. Gentlemen behind. Uh, my name's Tom Olson. Um My favorite game is Black Ops 2 um, because of the Zombies mod. Um, I'm gonna get, we're going to get a lot of these, right? Black Ops 2 and MW28 or whatever. Um, what's the obsession with war games? Why do people play games where you simulate going to war? There's a war on at the moment. You know this, right? Yeah, I mean, you can go. If you're out into it, they will have you. <laughs> you know? So what is, it's a serious question, what is the obsession? Or maybe questions like that are what we should start thinking about. Okay. Next to Evelyn at the back. Uh, my name is Ivo Fan. Yeah, and I like playing Dota 2. Do you know the game? Not really. Yeah. I, I, it's something I've heard of, but that's all. Yeah, it's like five people against five people in your map. Okay. Yeah. For killing and for... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Decent. A family fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn. Um, and it's By the way, these people are freeloaders. They're not doing the assessments or anything. So, you know. <laughs> My name is Evelyn. My name is What Reminds of Alice Ben. Alice Ben. You played that game before? It's like a storytelling game, but it's kind of also a horror game. You are playing the era of Ed, um, Alice and you are exploring what happened uh, in the ancient time of Washington and going to a big old house, going through different rooms and to find the reason why people died. Okay. So, like semi detective, semi horror. Yeah. Okay. It yeah, sounds. Like, I, can, I like to play it with my Nintendo in the bus, you know, like... Oh, yeah. Feeling it. Feeling so, um, there's a word for playing a game on a bus. Does anyone have any ideas what that is? Playing mobile games situationally in order to change the environment around you. Because when we play games, be it on your phone or Switch or whatever, in a public place. What are you doing? Walking 
augmented reality? No. So it was a bold effort, but you couldn't be more wrong if you tried. Augmented reality is when you put glasses on and it overlays the world with digital information. <coughs> a good effort. I like your stuff. How many people have read the module handbook? Actually read it, because the answer's in there. Not thoroughly enough. No. Not thoroughly enough, obviously. No. Okay. When we play something to change the environment around us, it's called ambient gaming. You change the ambience of the environment around you by engaging with something that is not in that environment. So if you take a switch somewhere, let's say you wait for a plane, right? An airport. Airports suck. I mean, big time. What can you do in an airport? Coffee. Overpriced crap in the terrible WH Smith. Terrible pastries. Or sit and play something which takes you into an environment which is outside of that environment you find yourself in. That is called ambient gaming. You are using a game to change the actual feel of the environment around yourself. Ambient gaming is an extremely important term. Um, we will be talking about it in a couple of weeks' time in a lecture, but <coughs> it's one of the dividing lines between the ridiculous argument that there is bet between serious gaming and casual gaming, as it's called. But we don't like to use the term casual gaming anymore, we call it ambient gaming. It's when people use mobile devices to play. I know at previous it was like, uh, <laughs> They're not gamers. Candy Crush Saga, if you play that, you're not a gamer. It's like, yeah, you are. But you are engaging in an ambient form of gaming rather than a stationary or positional form of gaming. So I'm glad somebody brought it up. Morgan. Uh, my name's Morgan. Um, I spent pretty much all summer playing games and I was working at school for a little bit. And um, Which school? Context? Uh, I used to my primary school. Doing what? Volunteering. As? Teaching assistant. In, a, in the summer? And the school's shut? Or oh, it's like oyster mouth different in the world? No, in June and July, yeah, yeah the okay. first half of the summer, and then the rest of the summer just spent just, just, just playing video games, really, just doing nothing. Okay, so what did you play? Um, or what, or what was the best thing you played? What was the best thing you played? Um, I returned to my favourite game of all time, which is arguably Fallout New Vegas. On what platform? PC. Why? Why is it so good? Because it is very, very, very moldable. It's... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and you mod or do you adapt mods for yourself? I adapt mods myself, so mainly just performance and gameplay improvements. Mm -hmm. Not like massively. But you mod. got it moving 60 frames per second, so like... Yeah, because the, the port is so old, it doesn't work. Well, yeah, the game's got to be, so. what, 13, 14 years old, I suppose? 2010, I think it was in 12. 12, yeah. Okay. I know, it's, it's that generation, I know. It is good, Fallout New Vegas. It's probably the best of the series, I would say. Mm. Jessica. So, my name's Jessica. Um, I spent summer bartending and playing games and drinking. And my favorite. I can't game... prove of this. <laughs> you yeah. have got. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite games are probably anything from the Bethesda's and um, Elder Scrolls. Why? Oblivion, Skyrim. I like um like just stepping into someone else's shoes and having a whole world to explore and stuff. Oh. I love that. Um, oh, that's exciting. It's just so far away from like your real mundane life. I don't know. Is your life mundane? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the sad times for Jessica. But, <laughs> um, <clears throat> stepping into someone else's shoes and experiencing their world through that character. There is a word for that. Does anyone have any ideas what that word is? You highly educated people in the third year of your degree, have you got any clue? I'm not going to add anything to that. Have you got any clue? Okay. The word we are looking for, people, and it's important to take note of this, is embodiment. <coughs> One of the core functions of games as entertainment and as games as an experience is embodiment. We embody another character. In a particular way. There are different ways of doing this, you can do it from a first person perspective or a third person perspective, but 
How weird is it when you sit back and think about embodiment? Here is a character on screen that Cheska feels like she is experiencing a world through. Think about that. That's really weird. How do you do it? What's the link between you and the character? I just mod my character so that I kind of feel like she looks a little bit like me. Okay. And then... That's creepy, but I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just... And then, I don't know. Learning, we're learning quite a lot about you now. <laughs> um, but... Uh, in a more mundane sense than that, which is important, avatar design is definitely important, mm. and how we embody through an avatar is really important. If we've got the ability to modify, not all things will allow us to do that. But let's, let's take it a step back even further than that. How do we actually embody something on a screen? What is the mechanism? You project yourself. You do, but there is something in between. See, the answer is perfectly <coughs> obvious, but you're all overthinking it. Medium? What does that mean? <laughs> Chuck buzzwords at me. It's the medium. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> you have to do things to, to get What do you do? You have to do things. She's doing the fucking oh, actions, all right? What do you do? Okay. What's in them? Nice. Hand eye coordination. Mother. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What are you holding to do that? <coughs> a controller, thank you. You always have something to interact with what is going on on the screen. The controller. This is a really creepy hand gesture, by the way. But it is also a perfect hand gesture. Because you don't think about the controller even when you're talking about that. It's all about this. When you play, the controller disappears. If you embody, you are not looking at the controller. Because to look at the controller is to draw your attention away from it. Now you've all got the experience, right? First 15-20 minutes, half an hour of playing a game for new, it's weird. Yeah, It takes you a while to get used to the feel, again, of the controller in your hand, because the controls are slightly different. But with a little bit of practice, and this is a, a, a design issue with games here. You design games in a particular way to give you a, a very steep learning curve of getting used to the controller in your hands to control the character. If the game is designed well, after a little while you forget that you're holding it. And that's when the body embodiment occurs, because you are not concentrating on your bodily gestures anymore and sort of practices of using your hands. They are automatic, and it's at that point that when you are doing things without being conscious of doing them, and your character is mirroring what you're wanting it to do, then you start to feel embodied in something. Fair? Okay. This will be counted in week four or five, I can't remember. It'll be on the screen shortly, which, which week it is. But that process of having knowledge in your hands is really, really important for gaming. There isn't really another interface yet. That, I mean, I guess theoretically there could be, but at this point in time, I don't really see any other interface apart from having, you know, using your hands to control what is on the screen. And because of that, our hands are incredibly important in terms of what we do, unlike any other media form. I mean, do you have to do shit with your hands when you're listening to the radio? No. I mean, the only other form of media I can think of where the hands are really, really important is pornography. But that's a whole different thing, and, you know, and, yeah, let's, that, that is for a different module. Um, so, the interactivity between us, the device, because we never interact directly with the character on screen. It is always mediated through our contact with a device which we have inputs into, which then are reflected by on screen. And a bad game will do that badly. Really, the core of what is good and what is bad in gaming can often come down to that interface, whether something is good or bad to control. 
It's, it's really, it can often be that simple. I mean, a great example of this is they've kind of weirdly got it right, right at the end of the cycle. But I'm sure there's some people in here who've played FIFA games. Yeah? Now, they're horrible. They are horrible, horrible games. And the interface between the controller and what goes on on the screen is really bad. You know, if you play simply, it's okay. And you can learn how to make yourself good at it. But the actual interface itself is like designed by some sort of like person who doesn't have fingers. It's absolutely terrible. Weirdly, the, the, they've been <coughs> kicked out of that franchise now, EA, and the last game of all is actually pretty good for some unbeknownst reason. They've finally put some effort into it. Eve. Hello, from Eve. Um, I've it got, cold? I've got a cold. You've got one? Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for coming in. I've had it for three weeks. I, we really appreciate that. <laughs> so, you'll be fine. Um, I spent my summer in America, France, and Spain. Um, <laughs> And I've never really played a video game religiously enough to say it's my favourite because my dad always wanted the PS4. Um, but that happened. <laughs> I have religiously played Homescapes on my phone for the past few years. I am I am a sixty year old woman. <laughs> <laughs> I I've never played those games, but I've had the adverts, mm. and um, I hate those games. <laughs> Just do the adverts. I hate those games. Why would you play Homescapes? And I want to use the word you use, religiously. Because uh, I can design a house. You have to of the Sims, right? That cost me money. I'm waiting until October 18th when it's free. Isn't it, is it The Sims is free with... Oh, okay, I've got PS... I don't well, want... I've like, got PS Premium. I no, like premium. on a Mac. Okay. On a Mac. Don't... Oh, okay. Heads up as well, please don't use a Mac for gaming. Yeah. <laughs> they, they really are designed to do that. If you're clean the fan if you can before you start. They're really not designed for that. Ben. Yeah, Ben. Um, I spent all summer working in Point Street, and uh, my favourite game of all time is uh, Cod 4. Why? Uh, nostalgia, because that's the first game I ever played, and that's what me and my dad used to play together for years. Um, but also just because. I think it's one of the most down to with the most realistic war games there actually is. It's got, you know, the over the top set pieces at the time is short, but it's nothing like the rest of the franchise where it just gets fucking ridiculous. So it's, just, it's just simple fun. I get that. I, I, I am interested in the word realistic there, because the extent to which uh, we can take the war game genre as a good example of this, right? You, you read reviews of uh, games in that genre, and they'll often use the word realistic without any context of what realistic would mean. Because, let's be fair, I don't wish this on anyone in this room. It, well, maybe one or two of you, right? But, in order to have a realistic experience of war, what do you need to do? You need to go to war. Quite, yeah. You need to get suited up and go and do it. But we often use the word realism in the context of games. Um, over the weekend, I, I, I didn't have anything on this weekend. I was knackered after last week because they just went insane about induction. Which I got to applaud most of the people in this room for because you ignored induction totally and did not turn up on um, Thursday afternoon, which I was impressed with. Um, you know, there's some real cojones on show here. It's like a compulsory session for third years. Fuck that. I'm not going to that. You really set the tone for attendance at lectures going forward, which I was I was impressed with. Lost my train of thought now in that one. But um, <laughs> we use the term realism very often. Over the weekend I needed to recharge, so I put uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 on. I haven't played it in a long time. And one of the terms that is always used in Red Dead Redemption 2, it, like, invariably, and indeed, weirdly, even more weirdly uh, for a Rockstar game in Grand Theft Auto as well, is this term realism. I say, that ain't real. That is not what that period of time was like. It's a rewriting. It's a rewriting of history framed <coughs> in a really neat way. I mean, let's be fair, I, it's a previous generation game Red Dead Redemption 2 and it's like, like I say, I haven't played it in a long time, I put it on and like, god damn, this still looks really good, I mean this looks incredible still, um, you know, considering it's 
I was playing it on PS5, but there's no upgrade. It was just a PS4 game, really. But it ain't real. You know? And, I, and your point is really well made, I think. I think a game like that is about as real as it's going to get for us. But here's my question to you all on this point. Do we want it to be real? And do you really want to experience war as closely as possible? You want like grounded stories you can follow it without it being like, you know, uh, unrelatable then. But mm -hmm. for like gameplay mechanics, no, you don't want to sit in the bush for six hours. Quite. With a fucking rifle. Yeah. Eating out of a plastic bag of and dried stuff, you know. I, was, I saw something on TikTok yesterday about um, a Ukrainian soldier's war rations, you know, rations for a day. And you look what they have to eat. And, oh, shit, I feel really sorry. I felt sorry for them before, but now I feel really bad for those Ukrainian soldiers because that stuff looked terrible. I mean, it was like, oh my God. But, yeah, I, I don't want to be in that. If I did, I would have joined the army at 18 instead of joining Alcoholics Anonymous after my first year at university. And I would have done something different. So, um, there's a gap. We want things to be what, you know, as kind of simulationally real as possible. But we don't want to cross into real. And you can think about this in loads of different, it's like The Sims, right? And The Sims' predecessor was SimCity uh, back in the 90s. So SimCity was revolutionary when it came out. It was like this game where you know you design an entire city and then you've got all these metrics to say like how the citizens of the city love this city, how your businesses are doing, how prosperous your city is, and so on. And it's completely unrealistic. And one of the designers of SimCity came out a few years ago and said, yeah, we had to make it unrealistic because um, when we put <coughs> the game together, we forgot about parking lots. And they realised that actually if they designed the city properly, most of the city would be parking. Mm. And nobody's fucking interested in parking spaces. <laughs> so they just they thought, well, we could put this in, but we're not going to do that because people will just have to buy it, build loads and loads of parking lots. And it's like, nobody wants to build a parking lot, right? So we cut corners in order, to, you know, we preserve a simulation of reality, but we don't actually want to go real. Because the closer we go to real, the more boring and mundane it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a really, when you see the word realism, you have to think very critically about what that means in terms of gaming. And I think your point about that game is really important because it gets us into a position of reality, but takes away a lot of the things that are real that we don't want. So it almost like, curates reality for us in a particular way to make the game as interesting and as mechanically sort of good as it possibly can be without like so hiding in a bush for six hours. Yeah, we don't have to do that bit. Nick? Uh, I'm Nick. I spent my summer working and going away. Um, my favourite game is probably Sims. Which version? Four. Four. Any particular reason? Uh, I think just it's the most recent one. It's but why'd you like it? Just like um, sort of controlling a large that's not that now we get into it. <coughs> controlling the world. Because you all want to control the world, right? Don't we? And we could do a better job of it than the people in charge at the moment. So we play Sims. Is that, uh, who else plays Sims? Yeah, there's a few, yeah. I, I kind of expect quite a lot of essays on Sims in this. Uh, module. Um, when I was teaching at Brighton, I used to do a, like media texts um, module. There was about like eighty people on it. I had sixty essays about Made in Chelsea. Oh, Jesus. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 after about an hour of marking, <coughs> I really die. I really did. I've never seen Made in Chelsea. I've seen about five minutes of it. And I had to turn it off because I was really, I've got an expensive television and it's like, it was not going to last. So, yeah. Um, and Sims could go this way. Because <laughs> if loads of people do really crap essays, so do good ones. The Sims engenders a sense of power. You literally 
take over a life or several lives and watch them unfold and you have is that attractive? Why do we do it? There's this feeling about wanting to play God as that's kind of satisfying if you're that type of person. Okay, has anyone actually read the Bible? I was hoping you'd put your hand up. <coughs> Let's talk about Old Testament God. If the Old Testament God was playing Sims, what would he do? Kill everybody. Oh yeah. He would build a nice little town for nice little people and then he would smite those motherfuckers because that was what God was all about. He was tasty. He'd like to take shit down. He had reasons. But he, but, you know, he, he wasn't without justification sometimes. But God was badass. Does Plain Sims give us a sense of this? Mm -hmm. That we are hovering our hand digitally over these little minions that we've created. And at any point we come, bang, their shit. They start to piss us off. They're going down. This is a powerful feeling. It's one of the kind of unique game mechanisms where we are predisposed towards nihilistic responses to what we do. Most games, the mechanics are, you've got to keep this thing alive. Yeah? In The Sims, very often we think, nah, <laughs> down they go. <laughs> so, I kind of like The Sims for that reason, that it tempts us into moral choices other games don't actually force us into. It, it, it proposes, and it doesn't do this necessarily through you know, deliberate game mechanics, but the, by the, by the way it positions us as a creator, it creates moral choices within us. Moral choices in games are really, really important. One of the things I'll come to in a few lectures is about how games position, position us as moral agents. When you think of like any war game, yours in particular. What have you been asked to do? Well, it's sort of a Russian psychopath. Yeah. How? Well, kill him. <laughs> now this is only unusual, by the way. This is hardly psychotic in terms of game. <coughs> That's actually kind of measured. You know, if we look at something like Manhunt, for example, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Games, through powerful mechanisms of embodiment, ask us very often to embody characters who are morally compromised in particular ways. And therefore we are being asked to make moral decisions, which we don't necessarily reflect on be just because of that mechanism, that we are not in the game. So at the same time as us being in the game, we are also very often positioned out of the game in order to make these morally compromised decisions. Um, that doesn't excuse us in any way, shape or form. If you just create your perfect little sims in order to kill them in amusing ways, you shouldn't be allowed to own animals, okay, or have children, because you're obviously a very dangerous individual at that point and probably need help. Um, Dan? Yeah, uh, so I spent my summer working and learning how to surf, and my... How's that going for you? Uh, not too bad actually. It's Good. starting to get better now. Um, the first few months were pretty unbearable. But, <laughs> it takes uh, a while. Man. Yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> but I'm getting there. And um, I'll probably say my favourite game is Rainbow Six Siege. But I haven't played Why it. Why is that? Long. Um, I probably started like five or six years ago playing it. So I started on console and mm. then moved to PC and started playing it on that. Um, I literally didn't play anything else for about three years straight. Um, that's a commitment. Yeah, no, that um, is a commitment. But I just really love the competitive aspect of it. Um, and then like, it's quite heavily like, communication based and yeah. mechanical and things like that. But it's a good example, and there are many examples of this. And I'm sure a number of you, you said like the Legends for example, um, that competitive nature, usually PC based online, yeah. is a real hook. You know, and um, what the factors that go into that, the formation of community, the creation of uh, 
competition between one another until, of course, the early 2000s. Nothing like this existed. You know, we didn't. So I go back a long way before then in terms of playing games. And when I was a kid, who did you compete against? Yourself, pretty much. That was it. You know, there were yeah, you had two player games, but they were usually fight based or racing or football or something like that, and they were time limited in terms of the competitive element. You know, they, they didn't stretch out over a long period of time. You might have two Game Boys that you could link a cable to, so you could play someone in Tetris. That was about as exciting as gaming got in 1989. Um, it's an entire, you know, the intersection between gaming and the internet has created an entirely different form of engaging with games and with other people, importantly, as well. And I think it's that which is the important aspect that we can interact with other people. And of course, what emerges from that interaction with other people, as you know, because you did a whole thing on that, is toxicity of the highest right. order. <laughs> and I encourage you all, because it is still online, to go and watch Jasper's oh, video. Cringy. I, I hate this university <clears throat> song. Why have they said that? What is the matter with them? I'm Jack. Um, I basically spent the whole summer just working in dominoes and... So it, 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 that's, that's no good. That's no good. How, how many, how many out, out of, oh you were driving, you weren't, you weren't doing the pizzas. Because yeah. I've got to ask, right? Out of, say there's ten pizzas made, how many of them do the people making them spit in? A half. Okay, it's about 50%. I like them odds. Because, you know, um, when I was working in McDonald's as a kid, it was at least 95% of the burgers got spat in, so yeah. I, I like those odds. Sorry. Um, I'd probably say my favourite game is Rocket League. Okay, why is that? Um, Anyone, any other Rocket League players? Just because. Oh yeah, there is, there is, don't worry, but they just don't want to admit to it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun, I kind of like Rocket it's League. It's just a uh, symbol, it's yeah. like a car, football. Yeah, it's, it's, it's alright. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to get in with it. I'm, i got to admit, I'm not very good at it. I'm, I'm pretty it was terrible. Like, it was the first game that I got when I could actually do that. Um, How many hours did you have to put in to get good? Um, I don't know if I want to say. <laughs> I think you do. Yeah. I, I can't remember. Like, I'm not a liar. He knows exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fantastic. And, and good heads up on the dominoes as well. you got a 50-50 chance. Um, hi, I'm Jordan. Um, over the summer, just watched F1 and then went away. Um, and I've recently become really obsessed with Sims. So, do you play F1 games? Tried to, but then it like nearly broke my phone. So I, I see a lot. Of, I see a lot of videos on TikTok of people playing F1. You know, because you can you know, play against other, you drive against other people. And it's usually Irish people who lose their shit when they get barged off the course or something like that by some random who just hits the brakes too hard. It looks... I, I, mean, I couldn't do it because I would be raging after about 10 seconds. Why do you like F1? I can't um, think of anything more boring than like, watching a car go around in a circle. I don't know. It, it's like a kind of recent find over like the last year, I'd say. This um, is because you've switched your allegiances to Portland's Swansea City. <laughs> because they're so boring and so crap that you needed, needed to find something else to rival it and it was F1. Yeah, and <coughs> um, since like not swimming anymore, I kind of needed to find another sport to like invest myself in. So oh, no. <laughs> Seriously weak. But you know, whatever makes you happy. Hey everyone, I'm Mason and over the summer I basically just hang out with my friends and went on holiday to Corfu, cool which was nice. And then my favourite game growing up was probably GTA 4 because I could just do anything I wanted to without no limitations. <laughs> Confession, I never finished it. I, I sort of got quite far into GTA 4. I didn't play it for years after it came out because I was doing my PhD and I, was, I didn't want to get into it, it was too much. And then as soon as I finished my PhD I started playing GTA 4 and I never got to the end of it. I got an apartment on the roof of a building and I had a high powered sniper's rifle and all I did in the end was stand on the top of the roof shooting prostitutes 
and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I, I was like, I don't know if I can be bothered to finish this game now. <laughs> and I did that for about, <coughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie, I did that for about a week. And then I never played it again after that. I've still got it, and I've still got a 360 upstairs, and I, I can probably go back and do it, but I think I'd probably fall into the same thing again and just, yeah, use my rifle. So it's probably not for me. But it was absolutely groundbreaking at the time. You know, I'm surprised it's not been remastered. I will be honest, but if they can remaster Last of Us, I'm really shocked they haven't remastered that. Last but not least. Hello, uh, my name is Dostea, but you can call me Thea because it's just a weird Lithuanian name that no one knows how to pronounce. Um, it's not that bad. <laughs> I guess, you could, you could do worse. <laughs> uh, my summer was pretty good because I got to quit the job that I hated and then I went traveling for a bit, so I really enjoyed that. Um, it's always nice to quit your job. True. Yeah. It was really nice. <laughs> I can't wait to do it here. <laughs> and um, I enjoy a lot of different games, but I think lately I've been really enjoying these story-based games like Until Dawn or Little Hope. I'm it's interesting. The story is the thing that you find invaluable. Uh, yes, I just really enjoy that uh, as you play along you find these clues and the story unravels and also it kind of depends on your choices as well. Uh, yeah. So I find that really interesting. <coughs> these, these games have always been popular. The, um, we've got to be careful when we talk about games that are heavy on narratology, to use the correct term in gaming studies. Because that kind of flowing narrative gives us often the impression that we're the director of the action, whereas actually all of it is programmed beforehand. So our choices are not always, although we feel like we're making choices, of course our choices are limited in this. Interestingly, it's a game which doesn't depend on narratology in that way but the best example of how that how those games can set you up is uh, a game called Bioshock. Has anyone played Bioshock and do they know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I will talk about Bioshock extensively in one of the lectures because it's incredibly interesting because it positions you as if you are an active agent in the game and then literally pulls the carpet from under you right at the end and says, you didn't have it. And it, it makes it explicit that you had no choice in what you were doing whatsoever, even though you felt you had choices. That the story was telling you you were making choices in the game, and actually it, at the end it just says, ha ha, you didn't have any choice in this whatsoever. And it's kind of a meta uh, commentary on gaming itself in that sense. There is a massive debate in game studies, which has kind of been settled now. So there was a massive debate between narratology or what we call ludology. Do we want to understand games through story, or do we want to understand games through the mechanics of how games have been put together? That would be ludology. The, the ludology, ludics being what is the game mechanism itself. But narratology is still incredibly important because without a compelling story, we simply very often get bored. But it doesn't have to be given to us. That is really important. So, people who play The Sims, there ain't a story to The Sims. So where does the story come from? Because you, you have a story going on in your head about all those characters. So where does it come from? Your imagination. Yes. We project <coughs> story onto these things. You know, I always feel that generations ago of gaming, you had no choice to do this. You know, if I was playing one of my all-time favourite games is a game called Road Rash for came out for the Sega Mega Drive in like 1990. And basically it's psychotic. You're a, you drive a motorbike, you get chains and clubs off the other riders in the race and then you hit them and then you win. It's it's amazing, right? You you are player one, you have no name. <laughs> So you kind of invent a backstory for yourself to make this more compelling. And then the other riders, they have names. They are literally just a bunch of pixels on a screen, but it's like, oh my God, Viper, that piece of shit. I cannot wait to beat the crabber. It's not real. He's not a person. He doesn't have a family. 
you know, he wasn't mean to his cat when he was a kid, but you can invent all this stuff to justify whipping him with a chain <coughs> in the face while driving 100 miles an hour on a motorbike. Because you need to bring something to this, you know. The narratology of games is incredibly important in terms of how we engage with and how we have lasting relationships with games and characters and environments. So whereas that debate has kind of been settled on the ludology side, it is still important to always consider the story, be it the story that is given to us, or the story that we, as kind of mental people, make. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Uh, module outline. So, we have... 11 weeks, but only 10 lectures. Okay, important to note. Week six, nothing. It is assessment week. That is the week starting the 7th of November, I think. Um, we don't have anything this that week. So where do we go? History today, predicts <coughs> next week, what actually is play and games. Uh, ideology week three, conquest, capitalism and colonialism. Week four, what is a gamer? Week five, what is it to actually feel like we're playing a game? Week seven, an extension of that, presence and, affect and, and affectation. So that is more like we were talking about the um, feeling of controllers, the interface, how we um, embody. Week eight, narratology versus ludology, but the importance of story. Week nine, gender sexuality in gaming. Week 10, video game violence. And week 11, the games industry itself. As you will see in the right-hand column, there is reading for each week. That is all up on Canvas. I have locked the module down. You've got to access, you know, standard procedure for one of my modules. You access the um, module handbook and then it will unlock everything. These aren't that long, to be fair, these readings, but you do have to do them before the lecture because otherwise it won't make sense. The one that it looks really long is um, Getting Gamers by Jamie Madigan, which is three chapters. Those chapters are incredibly short. They're only like about eight pages or something like that, and everything is on canvas. I think there's one, like, I, I've given reading for this week, that's not essential this week. There's a book which is in the reading. I've, everything on the module is in a reading folder which you just link to off Canvas. It takes you to my Google Drive. There's like 80 books in there. So you don't need to go to the library or anything like that. There's one week that I couldn't put up for some reason. It's out there somewhere. Don't, so one, one of those weeks you'll look at it and think, oh, where's the reading for it? And don't worry about it too much. But. Those are the things I want you to read week on, week on. These are what I recommend. A lot of the module content follows this book. Um, understanding games and games cultures. Now, I don't have an electronic copy of that because simply because it came out at the end of 2021 I just haven't been able to find one yet. Um, the library does have a copy of this now, and it is an e-book, so it sh you should be all right if you, if you need a copy of it. That book is like 20 quid. You could probably get a second-hand copy off Amazon Art Marketplace for far less than that. If you did want to buy a book for the module, that would be the one I would recommend as the top one. This book is really, really useful and really comprehensive. I've, it is in the reading folder, um, Understanding Video Games. It's incredibly comprehensive on everything. It is a proper textbook. Um, so please get a free copy. How to Play Video Games is really, really neat. Uh, it, the way it's written is different from the other two. It's a very, very useful book. So again, there is a free copy in the... Um, reading folder of that. So those are the three, if, if you don't want to get into it, if you want to put in as little, e I'm looking at you Josh, if you want to put in as little effort as possible, those three will cover you, okay? But if you want to do well, there's a huge reading list in, uh, for every topic in the module handbook, which took me ages. So you better engage with it, because it did take me ages. 
Assessment one. Those of you who did the module with me last year, you'll be familiar, right? Um, I have adjusted what I did for social media to this. A gaming analysis project, keyword project. Uh, analysis of chosen video game and a critical reflection of the student's own play of that game. So it needs to be a project which shows you playing uh, using visual practices. None of your bullshit. I want videos, people. <laughs> That's how I'm doing it. I want videos to mark because then I can put them on 1.5 speed and it just speeds up my marking as well. It's so much easier. Uh, should take the form of a critical walkthrough of a digital game or a let's play, as they're more commonly known, uh, where students annotate their play with material from the modules by the critical, critical analysis. So if you did social media cultures last year, you'll be familiar with what I'm looking for. Did anyone not do that module last year? I think you all did. I think. Superb. You know what I mean. You know what to do. Yeah. It's a fact. <laughs> It says 12 to 15 minutes. We've been told this year that we have to crack down on length of things in assessments. So now if you go one word over the word count, you have five marks taken off. What? See, if you attended the thing on Thursday, you'd know this. Um, but of course you've decided not to. So this is now news to you, which is really poor. You know, and, and kind of shows how much you suck as an individual. It's not just you, but by the way, this is a, this is a general thing, dude, all right? <coughs> yeah, we've been told. Our key word is told. Ordered. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, if they ordered, that would be different altogether. But we have been told. I don't like being told. All right? I've never liked being told. I had 137 detentions in secondary school over five years. That is indication that I have never liked being told, quite frankly. That is a guideline. Now, if you creep up to anything like half an hour, I am not watching your bullshit, all right? If you got up to 20 minutes, because I understand that it is, you know, games unfold in different ways. If you feel you need longer to tell a story about what you're doing, you have longer. 12 to 15 minutes is pure guideline stuff. Rocket League, if you decided to do that, you could come in shorter. Because, let's be fair, it, that's, that's a stretch for a Rocket League game. Um, if you're doing a retro game of some kind, and I mean proper retro game, I don't mean like the last 10 years, I mean like 30 years ago, it might well be prudent to do something shorter than 15 minutes, for example, because a playthrough or something like that, if it could be a stage, I mean, most of you have replied to my task in the book, although you completely misunderstood it for some reason, I don't, don't know what, that was narcissism of the highest order, I was impressed, to be fair. Um, if I was doing this on that game, I'm only saying it because Cheska hasn't done this yet, so she needs to get her shit together and do the task. <laughs> do it. What is in the handbook? Yeah, it's it's an Easter egg in the handbook. It's, yeah, it's, it's like right at the bottom. It's like on the last page. No. It's, well, it, well, it, it is, and then there's an oh, Easter egg before it. Sorry. You're just not into it, are you? Nah, it's not really right. <laughs> It's not really my thing to give you a fair mark either, so you know, I'll just take that attitude forward. <coughs> um, yeah, look. I would like a heads up, that's all, with regards to length. If you feel you're going to go way over and you want to go over, and you want to do something which unfolds in a longer time, I just want to be told, that's all, because it will prepare me for what's coming forward. You know, I don't want to be sitting watching four hours. I don't want you to turn into PewDiePie, okay? That is a really important. If you turn into PewDiePie, I will slap you around a bit. So, because um, I hate that guy. Um, I've given a bunch of examples of channels, which you can take a look at. As you will see, nearly all of those channels have much longer videos. 
So I am looking for you to do something more condensed and focused than you would usually do on a let's play. I know some of you are twitchers, right, and you do things at a much longer scale. I am looking for something with corners around it. So it could be mission based, it could be stage based, it could be some, or, or you can assume that completely. And, and if you're doing Sims, you could perhaps look at the construction or something and how you do it over a period of time. Mess around with the video. If you do something and it takes an hour, we'll speed up the video and then you comment over the top of it so it comes in shorter. That's, that's fine. Because you're still doing the important part for me. Um, please have fun with it. Fun videos are much easier to mark and much and get much better marks. This comes in in December, so you've got loads of time. Okay, there is plenty of time to this. It says a bit at the bottom of non-video projects. Screw you. This video, you know, video games, uh, digital games, are a visual medium. They are played. There's no way you can't do recording of this. In terms of technological aspects, if you have problems and you're not able to, or you, at least you're not able to conceptualise how you're going to make a recording of this, please come and see me, we will work it out. If you don't have a console or a PC, looking at you. Hello. Um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks I will be able to give you a switch. To do. I've got a load of them. They're in Kia Hardy building somewhere. Because it's like, you know, I, they're mine. I own them. Well, the university owns them. I mean, at least one of them is going to my house. <laughs> and it's not coming back. <laughs> but I will... They will be done in the next couple of weeks. I've just got to meet Ian and we've got to sort them out. And we've got to put um, a university-owned um, Switch Online account on it so we can access games on it. But we will also have, at some point in the next while, uh, Series Xs and gaming PCs in the basement of um, James Callahan building. Mm -hmm. So there will be stuff there. We did ask for Pac-Man... Um, arcade machine like an original we don't know if it was bought or not there's a big box and we're not sure what's in it so we might have one of those <coughs> and that would rule I mean let's be fair that would be awesome right? Um, I just want to do a Simon 2 let me take a break for 5 minutes right? Simon 2, 2500 word critical essay it will take the form of a critical review of a game of your choice so Basically, two assessments here, two games. The games cannot be the same, so you have to have two different games to talk about. It is not reflective. I want to absolutely make that clear. That's where this is different to doing the social media module from last year. This is not a reflective review or anything like that. Written in formal academic style, you need to trip down the analysis.